thank you to, for joining us um, to our first hyper chat uh, on, on what I think is a fascinating topic that with the discussion started online. Uh, so very excited to have a, a very broad group of people joining. I know we have people from the commission, we have people from companies, we have people from Digital Europe, we have people from lots of different areas. Um, and I hope that we will continue the conversation that started on Twitter. Uh, and this will be you know, bouncing off and, and, and talking about some of these things and then coming back to, uh, to this discussion and then back to Twitter afterwards. So that's the concept behind hyper moderation and these, these hyper chats. So this is our first hyper chat of 2020. We had hyper drinks before, but you know, we're taking it one level up all the way to the hyper chats, uh, which is basically a fairly, an informal conversation on a topic that we think is, is interesting, significant, and that we want to, to explore. Um, now, this started with a conversation on what could the impact of COVID-19 be on the social media platforms. And, and what you might have seen is that, you know, when you go to Twitter, when you go to Facebook, you're getting more and more of these warnings saying, you know, here, if you want to check official information, WHO or your government, here is, uh, you know, where you can find it. And so for me, it's the first time that I see these platforms actually making a, uh, a concerted effort to kind of direct people to the right place, or at least to a more legitimate source of information, which I think is a very interesting change. And I think it's a kind of admission that they can have a lot more control over content than they often uh, imply. And my real question behind this debate, and I'd like us to explore that among you know, the other topics that we're going to talk about, is, is this uh, a, a real change that they won't be able to come back from? Because once they've done that, it basically says, well, they can uh, control to some degree content and therefore they're liable and responsible for content and therefore things need to change. So that's a little bit of the question that I, I'd like us to explore together. Now we have three amazing people on the panel today and uh, lots of people in the chat room, lots of people on Twitter joining in the conversation. Um, and uh, before we turn to our amazing um, guests, I'd like to turn to Leora to discuss how we're going to hyper moderate this uh, and what's happening. And we have a lot of people in the background looking at Q&As, looking at questions. So if you have technical questions, please drop them in the Q&A. Uh, and if you have comments, you can also drop them in the chat, which, is, which everyone can see. And of course, on Twitter using the hashtag hyperchat. Leora, tell us about hyper moderation. Um, yes, so welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining this hyper chat. Um, as Phil said, we already have a lively debate going on on Twitter. Please join that debate. If you do, use the hashtag uh, hyperchat. And if you start your own post, then please uh, tag us at uh, ZN Consulting. Um, I uh, copied uh, the main conversation into this uh, chat uh, at the top. And there you can see a very interesting uh, debate that's already happening. I will share it with you uh, right now. And the question was, um, you will see it here, should social media platforms be held accountable for misinformation? Um, then Dr. Todd uh, Wallen, who is an influencer in the vaccine movement said, there is a balance of freedom of speech versus harm to others. It's why people are not permitted to scream fire inside a theater or bomb on board a plane. Some amplified information can cause harm, suffering and death. Social media is a powerful amplifier and he added that hashtag vaccines work. Um, and then, um, and then we had Matthew saying, well, yeah, that might all be true, but um, I wanted to point towards this, uh, re this reply, which got a lot of re responses. Do we really want to set up a Facebook or Google as censors? It's from Jeff Jarvis to decide what's real and fake, true and false. And to that, uh, we had uh, Ryan Heath responding and he said, um, it's not only, um, about, uh, I'm sorry, I'm having trouble 
pulling up Ryan Heath's quote, but he said, uh, it's not only about what we want. I don't want the platforms to be censors, but I also don't want non-transparent systems deciding who gets to see the news and opinions I share, being denied compensation and copyrights. So just to summarize that there is a very, um, um, very interesting uh, conversation going on and uh, we would love for you to continue to be a part of it. Now, during this specific hyper chat, if you have any questions for the speakers, you can share them either in the chats um, or just raise your hand. Uh, you have that option uh, as a feature um, and uh, then I will um, make sure to pass them on to the speakers or give you the floor if we have the time or also at the end during the question and answer session. Should you have any problems uh, in terms of technical problems, there is also a Q&A bar that you see here at the bottom of the screen. Um, and if you have a question there, then uh, our technical people will take care of that. So chats for mm -hmm. questions about the subject and Q&A for technical questions. Um, I will also be sharing polls and at the end of the, uh, the get together today, we'll do a very fun Kahoot quiz about the subject. So I will want to start uh, just before we get to Jennifer, Brussels geek, um, and we'll announce, announce her or for those who need an introduction, of course, he's very famous. Um, we just want to start with one question to, uh, to start and to get your feeling because the point we really want to get your input on this. And the first question is, uh, here you see it, should social media platforms be held accountable for misinformation yes no or not sure and after the first segment with jennifer i will share with you the results thank you um so we're going to start uh, by turning to uh, jennifer baker and after damien rack and i'll introduce uh, damien in a second but of course for most people on this uh this hyper chat they know jennifer baker she's the leading eu influencer in tech she's a journalist she writes the BBC, she writes for Euractiv, um, and she's also the Tweet of the Week uh, icon that entertains us with amazing insights on what's happening in the Twitter sphere and one of the founders of EU Tweet App. So that is already a lot of things. You can see her Twitter profile uh, right there. Um, and of course, she's very active on Twitter. She has very strong, I think, beliefs and ideas around the issues personally, not just as a, an expert in the topic. And I think that's what I'm really interested in getting in here, because I, I really hope that we're at this kind of pivotal moment where maybe we can finally make social media platforms accountable. And of course, it comes with this, you know, the, the question of censorship and can we make it work even if we all wish for something. Uh, so my question for you is basically to, to get you started. And then after that, Jennifer will share her thoughts. It's basically, um, do you think that COVID-19 is making Facebook and social media in general more accountable? Is it going to make them into better companies or is just th this just uh, wishful thinking? Please take it away. Um, maybe is the short answer to that. And it, it was much easier to answer that. <laughs> Well, it's, um, it, the, the question you asked before is, should social media companies, should tech platforms be accountable? That's also a quite short answer. The answer is, in my opinion, yes. But there is a difference between being accountable and being legally responsible. And that's, I think, what you're getting at. I mean, I wrote recently that we have this once in a decade chance with the Digital Services Act to maybe change how these platforms are formally regulated as opposed to self-regulation. Uh, so I think there's a lot there that can be done. There's a lot of different problems. So what I'd like to do is kind of go back and, and have a look at some of the problems and where the idea of disinformation has come from, because certainly COVID-19 could be a turning point. But I want to start back with that other thing that we thought was going to be a turning point, which was the Cambridge Analytica scandal several years ago. This is why we've heard this term disinformation. It sort of exploded onto our screens in a big flurry when that scandal between Facebook and Cambridge Analytica came back. Now, I'm sure most of you know this, but just as a brief recap, they're a company, they, they took, they used the information from Facebook, they were supposed to be doing research, but they used it to sort of 
power political campaigns and did what we call micro-targeting based on people's own information. They were able to share very, very targeted messages, manipulate people when they were at their most vulnerable into voting a certain way. Of course, that was supposedly the, the, the driver behind the success of the Leave the EU in the Brexit campaign and Donald Trump's presidency. So those are really huge scandals. And you would have thought, and at the time there was this big push, we're going to clap down on these platforms, we're going to change things this can't happen again here we are not you know half a dozen years later and we're seeing another problem with this COVID-19 pandemic um, I want to get into a little bit what the differences are uh, in a moment because they are there are differences between political misinformation and disinformation and, and what we're seeing now with the COVID-19 situation but there are also quite a lot of parallels as well so when this scandal broke in relation to political micro-targeting one of the things a lot of people pushed back on and said is this is actually just good old fashioned propaganda. This is good old fashioned sort of slagging off your opponent, talking down your opponent. We've seen this before. What's so new? Well, there are a lot of things that are new. Obviously, the digital age and in particular social media platforms have had a dramatic effect on how we consume information. And I call those the three V's. There's volume, velocity and vector. So starting with the first one, volume, that's fairly self-evident, you know, before we used to read a newspaper in the morning once a day, or maybe an evening newspaper and watch the evening news, or maybe listen to the lunchtime news in the radio. So, you know, you were talking at a few points during the day, you would consume your overall news and it was finite. And then you maybe didn't read another paper until the next day. So the amount that of news that we are getting is huge. The internet is a wonderful thing. I wouldn't be without it. It is wonderful it's very democratizing to have all this information at our fingertips um, it's very much of a less top-down model in terms of people getting information but it is a huge volume and our human brains are not necessarily very well wired to cope and sort and categorize that volume of information on a daily basis uh, the next thing is the velocity the speed with which it's coming on to you i touched on that because it's related to the volume it is all the time, always on. Now, there was a switch, we had 24 hour news channels, so they were rolling 24 hours, but now it's happening even faster. You know, if a big incident happens, you're gonna find out about it on Twitter. It will have gone around the world twice before even the best and fastest reacting news teams can get a camera to the site or get a reporter to the site or talk to the key players and give you the more formal reporting. So the speed is, is constant. And then lastly, the vectors. These are the directions that we're getting the news from. So it's not coming from an authoritative source, a newspaper. It's coming shared from you by your friends. It's coming through the sites that you've chosen to prioritize. And this is what creates these filter bubbles. So a rumor comes from a friend who may have shared it four or five times and there's no way of really tracing back where that originated. Alternatively, you go and you choose that you're going to join a group and listen to the news that they share, which creates absolute strange little micro ecosystems. You know, you only go to a flat earther website and read through the comments and the discussion. There's no one there actually even putting the counter argument. What they're arguing about is what nature of flat earth we have. So you create this ridiculously tiny, narrow minded group of people who don't let any outside information in. Some people do do that. They take it to complete extremes. But we all, to a certain degree, for our mental health, if nothing else, choose not to listen to arguments that challenge us very strongly, that make us angry, that we think are fundamentally wrong. So these three Vs, these volume, velocity and vectors of how information comes to us has really changed the nature of propaganda, if you want to use an older term, but active disinformation campaigns as we now see happening. And that's not just a problem for us as users, that's also a problem for the tech companies. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm very big on bashing big tech, but I do have to admit they, they face the same problems we do. You can read many media, media reports that explain how the moderators on, on some of Facebook's various nastier sites and, and so on pages find that they've got PTSD symptoms because of what they're having to do. So there's, there's a whole lot of different questions about how to moderate this content that just overlooks the fact that it is huge. It is an awful lot of things to, to plow through. Now I've touched on some of the, the various sort of flat earth, you know, there's a lot of extremist content online. In relation to the COVID-19, we're seeing some very specific narratives. Um, there was the political narrative. Um, 
And we saw from the EAS uh, Stratcom report recently, they uh, pointed the finger at Russia and China. Now, maybe there's been pushback from China. That's a whole scandal we can talk about later if people are interested. But in terms of political disinformation and in terms of the money and the forcefulness with which those campaigns can be delivered, it, is, it does seem to be China and Russia. And what we're seeing there is a, is a narrative that the EU isn't handling the crisis well. We're seeing campaigns to say that uh, perhaps it was invented, that it's a bioweapon that has been deliberately created by Western governments, um, that this is a conspiracy to, uh, by Western authorities to control the populace. And all of this is, is, is macro-political on one level. It is, is really there to simply undermine stability in the Western democracies um, and in their handling of it. As well as in some cases we see a narrative as well that China is the one that has actually managed this best. China is the one that's reaching out to give masks and, and PPE to, to people in Europe. There's also a narrative, a little, there's, there's a religious narrative from some parts. There's, there's people within religious groups claim that they, you know, that this sort of, this bioweapon won't target them. Um, again, it's about consolidating community within those groups. Health hoaxes um, are a little bit more difficult to get your head around and understand because I think they fall into, into two different camps, as it were. Uh, the malicious actors and the scared actors. Now, if you look at the, the scared actors, they may be people, uh, and, and they cross over quite a lot, they are people who are just sharing disinformation because they feel so afraid and they are trying to share things they think might help, that they think might do something without actually fact checking. And that's that rush to share, that rush to, to propagate this disinformation. And the people that are sort of developing these campaigns in the first place know that. And that's why it's all about micro-targeting. It is targeting these vulnerable, scared people, knowing that they will amplify the message. The other element of targeting going on with the so-called uh, health hoaxes, uh, things like 5G may be causing this, um, they are targeting people who are angry and distrustful of big government. So the anti-vaxxers, they are distrustful of big pharma. They think vaccination is a, a hoax, it's, it's, it's a manipulation of them. The people who are lashing out at 5G, again, they're distrustful of big tech, but also their governments. And they can't really attack the governments directly, so they're going out and burning towers. But it's all part of sowing the seed of distrust and mistrust of authoritative sources, which rolls into, it's a vicious circle that rolls back into making your disinformation campaign much more effective. Now, there are people, I think, who are doing this in a very, in a very controlled, very calculated, very directed way. There's also, as I say, there's the scared and, and the scary. I think that there's, there's people then like David Icke, he's a, he's a former British footballer who actually believes the world is run by lizards and he's sharing at the moment all this, very much pushing this vaccination, uh, sort of vaccination conspiracy and the 5G conspiracy. He's, he's hardly pushing that. Now, you look at someone like David Icke and you probably think, I don't really think he's got a political agenda. He's just patently a very unwell man with a lot of problems. But he's also got a big audience and he is, he's being heard by the very people who are most receptive to his message because coming back to these things, this is the vectors, this is back into your filter bubble because you, if you're going to be receptive to David Icke's messages, you've joined the group. So the vectors that you're getting your information from are going to sort of artificially push that information towards you. Um, then we get on to the how the information is pushed at you because it's algorithms that are doing that. And this is where your tech platforms come in and how much responsibility they have and how much control they have because they are not necessarily the ones creating this information. Of course they're not. They are not coming up with the hoaxes. Mark Zuckerberg isn't sitting there thinking, oh, I know what I could say today. This would, this will get them all going. But he has designed a machine that makes it more likely for this sort of extremist, crazy, laughable even stuff to spread. And as I say, they have got the same problem with the volume, that's, that's just getting all those fact checkers in, with the velocity, the speed with which they can react to something. You take, for example, things like live shootings that are being streamed, the big tech platforms like YouTube or whoever struggle to shut those down quick enough because of the speed with which they're delivered. And then the vectors. This is where we're asking big tech to vet sources. We're asking them to decide what is an authoritative source, what is real news, what is not real news. And those are all really, really big challenges because you have to ask questions about legitimate reporting. 
if you've got the President of the United States standing at the White House podium suggesting that maybe drinking bleach isn't such a bad idea, you need reporters to report on that because that is something that we need to discuss. But you also need these same reporters to report it in a responsible way. You need them to say, this is slightly crazy, this goes against all the scientific advice. You don't want them to say, headline, president says drink bleach. And so even mainstream traditional media can get their reporting tone wrong. And we have a history of journalistic ethical standards, norms and values that don't exist partly due to just time, partly due to all these points I've raised about the way in which we consume information. They don't exist in the publishing, if you like, world of social media. And they also have to weigh it up with questions of freedom of speech. Again, this is something that traditional media journalists have been trained for and practiced in. And you know, as it, these, these norms and ethics and values, they are not something to, to sort of, they might not be written in stone, they might be you know, subject to interpretation, but these are things that I think we need to hang on to and that we think we need to in some way impose on the social media platforms because freedom of speech is important. You don't shut things down as, as Ryan mentioned in our Twitter chat, uh, we don't want them to be the online censors. They don't want it either. They don't want that level of responsibility. So, so far the EU has just gone with this self-regulation, this code of practice and disinformation, which it set up in response to the Cambridge Analytica scandal but it doesn't really go far enough because, and this is what I always bang on about, I always come back to the same point, if you've heard me speak before, you'll have heard me say it many, many times, the business model is selling your data and it's relying on advertising. And these corporations are in the business of selling your data for advertising. And if they're selling it, they're selling it to those malicious actors who want to spread disinformation, as well as the New York Times or the you know, Bristol Evening Post or Le Soir, you know, it's, it's not really up to them when they're, when they're thinking about who they take their advertising money from to say it's not, in, it's not in their interest to say, we don't want your money, Russia Today. We don't want your money, um, Press TV. You know, and they might say that ethically, but you can't ask corporations to do that because that's not their job. So the Digital Services Act that is being prepared by the European Commission is, as I said, I think it is a once in a decade because of how slowly the legislation works, a chance to get this right. And there's a lot of difficult questions to ask. And of course, the tech platforms have to be part of the conversation of how we get those right. But there has to be real regulation, real accountability, because self-regulation simply won't work. In my opinion, maybe breaking up the business model so that it's not reliant on the source of data that makes spreading this disinformation so easy um, maybe a bit of you know social distancing in terms of how much data we're sharing and spreading would, would go a long way to, to clamping down. I mean, I think it's a difficult question. It's a difficult challenge to put to them, but I think that's the low hanging fruit that we could personally, I think we could really tackle and, and break up some of these monopolies of data, break up some of these vectors. And uh, we can't do anything about the velocity or the volume, but we could break up the vectors in the way in which this information is being delivered to us in a way, just, just protect the most vulnerable first, and then we can get into the more difficult layered questions afterwards. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Uh, you covered a lot of grounds there. I like the volume velocity vector thing. I think that's pretty cool. Tweetable as well. So <laughs> we, we, we go out with this. We're tweeting some of this uh, as we speak. So if you follow the discussion on Twitter, you'll see that we're going to be sharing some of these quotes. Um, so thank you for, for, for exploring that. I think it's, um, I mean, of course, it is a difficult uh, problem to solve, um, but I think that there needs to be, a, you know, a lot more energy into doing this. And I think COVID-19 shows us that, you know, you, this, this misinformation can kill. It's really, you know, this is not an exaggeration. You should not drink bleach. And thank you for the people posting this on the, the, the chat. I mean, how, how the hell do we have this conversation? But you shouldn't. Um, but the point is, I think there needs to be a shift. And, and I think you're right, we had the problem with Cambridge Analytica and that didn't really change the overall environment. Uh, so the question now is this, will this tip things over politically or, or to other people? Now, I wanna jump over to Leora because she's been looking at both the uh, chat and uh, online, so Leora, Anything exciting, uh, questions that, that, that came out of there that we can um, put to Jennifer and then go over to Damien. 
Uh, definitely, a lot of exciting things happen happening. A lot of people share, sharing questions in the chat as well. Thank you, guys. Um, I wanted to start with Audrey, who said that Jennifer is the Beyonce of tech in the EU bubble. <laughs> no, I like that. I don't know if you like it. I think it's a, I think it's great. Um, Audrey also said that the hashtag Don't Drink Bleach is trending on Twitter and that that means we live in a crazy world. So thank you for your comments, Audrey. Um, Philip has said a lot of things in the chat. I will uh, pull him in a little bit, uh, but he, he had a very good question. Um, and he also said, shouldn't Facebook and Twitter start with deleting all the fake and anonymous accounts and the disputed accounts, cleaving the non-identified users? How difficult can that be? Uh, Hugh Barton Smith had an example, but not from social media, about the Greek Orthodox Church who refused to amend its Holy Communion practice to protect um, people against Corona, uh, saying that it cannot transmit illness. So that's interesting, although not completely related to this <laughs> chat, but very interesting. Um, on, on Twitter, Luke uh, Chomet said, we need to strike a balance given the specific, uh, specific, specific, no, specific of social media, at least start trying for years, irresponsibility has been a policy. And for him, that's the main issue. And Francesco, Francesco Tra, Tra, Tramontan from Mondelez says, it's easy to say yes to accountability, but reality is much harder and they need to find a way to promote trustful sources and good practices and ban harmful ones, but bring liability, just to, to say being liability, being liable, sorry, there was a typo, uh, for all info does not seem realistic. Now, I would like to pull in uh, Philip uh, with his question about the definition of misinformation. Um, I'm just going to try and find him. Oh, there you are. Uh, Philip, um, you're now allowed to talk. Um, could you maybe ask Jennifer about this? Well, um, my question is uh, an easy one, but difficult to answer. Uh, define misinformation, because if you talk, as you said, about accountability and responsibility, you have to define the, the, the fault. So many times the information is not, or the truth is not... Uh, not easy. For instance, uh, in Belgium, we have a discussion with the face masks. What is what is the truth? What what is mis misinformation regarding face masks? Because nobody knows. So, uh, it's. I was reflecting to the question of the uh, of the poll uh, that it was hard to difficult to um, answer it because what is misinformation? Um. Well, I think, I mean, certainly you're, you're asking questions about truth, and that's, that's a very easy track which we won't get into. I mean, personally, I define uh, misinformation broadly as false information, which again, your, your question is, but the second part is with the intent to do harm. And that intent to do harm is very important. The discussion around face masks certainly is debatable, but from what I've seen of it, and I have followed this discussion quite a bit, um, in my other room here, I've got a sewing machine set up where I'm making face masks. Um, and whether or not people think they should wear them, I don't think people saying they're not necessary is actually an intent to do harm, it's an attempt to reassure. So this question of, of, of deliberately trying to do harm is the one that we have to focus on. Um, and then just responsibly weighing up other questions, um, acknowledging that there might be different sides of a debate, although, not necessarily giving equal weight to both sides of the debate. Um, you don't say one side says drink bleach, the other side says don't drink bleach. You actually, you know, you lean heavily on the science, you lean on the facts. And that's difficult if you're looking at things in an absolutist way without taking examples. But that's why we have to think about how this works in the real world. So the intent to do harm for me is the big, the big point because you can have misinformation that is not intentionally setting out to do harm. There may be uh, you know, a, a typo or, 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 or a mistake made in, in reporting that could happen, um, but the intent was not to do harm and it can be corrected. Whereas misinformation, when we're deliberately talking about campaigns and misinformation, have a set agenda that is not in the interests of the users, the people who read them, it's an attempt to deliberately mislead them. We have a related question from Sean. Um, Sean? Do you want to go ahead? Yeah, yeah. Hi, Jennifer. Uh, like, yeah, thanks for doing this. It's, uh, it, it's fascinating to watch uh, people discuss an, an important issue, you know. But it, it's a two-part question. Um, who gets to fact-check the fact-checkers? 
Uh, for example, you might have noticed today at the Irish Independent Day the great headline called Wealth versus Health. And uh, it leads on to, like, do you see a massive conflict of interest developing in the coming months between health professionals who are trained to preserve life and economic professionals who are trained to preserve wealth and how that will affect the dissemination of uh, official sanctioned information online? A little small little question to sort of uh, mull over. Health versus economics. I, I think that is a very important conversation to have in society. Um, I don't know if I would necessarily frame it like that because I think why shouldn't we have a robust and healthy populace and a robust and healthy economy? Um, and, and I agree that that is a question for politicians. I mean, you mentioned state sanctioned messaging. Uh, if it's state sanctioned, then that comes down to whether you trust that state. So state sanctioned messaging from China or Russia or North Korea, I may react very differently to state sanctioned messaging from Belgium or Italy or France. Um, you then also need to talk about where your politics lie. And I don't think that is necessarily for these sorts of conversation, a question of disinformation, unless one side of this sort of debate, if you want to frame it in terms of an either or debate, is using a disinformation campaign to push their message or push their agenda. And um, we have laws around this sort of thing in Europe around sort of around electoral campaigning, which are very clear in Ireland. We've actually got some of the most strict laws in terms of electoral campaigning and where, and where funds can't come from. So I, I do think we our laws in Europe, I actually think our electoral laws, which I think should expand a little more into general political campaigning laws, are absolutely ripe for an overhaul as well. But I don't think these questions are necessarily tech questions. These are cultural questions. So we shouldn't try to inform or enforce a, a tech solution on cultural questions, if you know what I mean. There's nothing wrong with an open and free robust debate. And indeed we want to protect that. So by shifting responsibility, if you like, onto tech companies without clear guidelines, we are making them censors. And I think that's a bigger problem in terms of freedom of expression and freedom of speech than, than maybe saying, I don't like this debate or how this debate is being framed. Um, plurality of media sources, I think is also very important. Um, who checks the fact checkers? I don't have an answer for that. <laughs> I'm just gonna say that is very difficult. Um, I mean, I would say each and every one of us should in a well-informed, well-educated society be able to make some sort of judgment on what we believe and what we don't believe. It's a little bit, like art, I don't know how to define it, but I know it when I see it. So I, I think that that is another question that we do need to have as a society. And I think, but I do think a lot of this does need to be put into clear, followable legal rules. The point about tech companies and trying to, trying to get them to regulate is not that we want them to be in charge. It's not that we want them to be the center of the regulators. I want laws holding them into account so that they're actually subject to the same laws and values of the society, whatever that society decides those are, as everybody else in the society and as everybody else in the media. Okay, very good. Um, I just want to get back to the polls and then we move on to Damien, who got up very early to be here. So I just want to make sure that we get to him. And so we had a poll, should social media platforms be accountable for uh, misinformation and these these are the results the most of you say yes they should and then we also have a large group of people say well I am not so sure um, let's also um, go to the next poll uh, which is about COVID-19 and social media how do you think COVID-19 is changing social media do you think it's having a positive effect a negative effect or do you not see much change at all? Um, I launched a poll for you now to vote. And then I will also immediately share the results and do the next poll, which I then will then share after Damien shares his views. And host and panelists can't vote. So I couldn't No, vote. we cannot vote. Which is good because it's quite a tricky question actually. <laughs> You can tweet, so it's fine. I can tweet, yeah. yeah. We, have the polls, we have the same polls on our Twitter channel at ZN Consulting, so should the panelists want to vote, you can still do this after uh, this session. Um, I think we're done. We're, um, oh, there's still a few votes coming in. No, there's still some people voting. 
It's still changing. <laughs> While we're waiting for that, may I take one of those questions that you mentioned that was in the chat that I didn't actually respond to, which is about the suggestion yeah. that- a little bit to the left so that we can see you, or to the oh, right. Oh, no, you're not seeing me. Yeah. Okay, um, so uh, the, uh, the question of whether the uh, Facebook and so on should be deleting these sort of uh, accounts. I do think it should be clear that they should only be, and they are actually doing it, the various social media platforms, should only be deleting malicious accounts and not just simply anonymous accounts because we do have a right to anonymity and there's a lot of people out there who might very legitimately want to protect their identity and still take part in what has become our cultural town square or you know our digital town square. So I would want to just, just push back on the suggestion that they should delete all anonymous accounts. It should really only be the malicious accounts. Very good point. I'm sharing the results. Most uh, of you guys, uh, people on the call, think it's a positive change to social media. Um, so that's interesting. Um, then I also want to go to the next poll quickly, which is about legislation. Um, I'm going to launch it for you. How should social media platforms handle misinformation? Should they, should they self-regulate? Should there be national regulation, EU regulation, or no regulation whatsoever? You can vote right now, um, and um, I will leave it open. And then after our next speaker, I will share the results. Excellent. So thank you very much. Um, thank you for, for engaging on this topic. And as I said, the whole purpose of this exercise is actually to kind of be part of a conversation that takes place on, that takes place on Twitter, that takes place uh, in this Zoom, but that continues after this. I think you can see me behind the legislation thing. So there you oh, go. Okay. Should I uh, close it? I have, has everyone voted? I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For anyone who, everyone who wanted to vote, there's still a lot of people who haven't voted, but I don't think they're going to. I'm gonna close it now and we'll share yeah. afterwards. So um, our second guest today is Damien Radcliffe, who has woken up at 6.30 in the morning. So I just wanna say, first of all, thank you for doing that. Uh, so Damien is in the United States where there's a discussion about bleach that you might have heard about. Uh, so he's at the heart of this disinformation challenge. I've known Damien for many decades. Uh, in fact, we, we, we started, uh, we, we met at Oxford when working on a student radio station together. And Damien was already being a journalist right then. So uh, his career is, is very long. He's still a journalist today, but he teaches at the University of Oregon and he's focused on a number of topics, including local journalism, social media, and he podcasts, I don't know if that's a verb yet, but he podcasts in something called Demystified Podcasting. Um, and he's been talking amongst other topics on uh, misinformation. So uh, thank you so much for, for being with us today. I think it's interesting, uh, Damien is British, but from a US perspective, maybe. Um, so maybe I can, I can start with a question. I, I know you actually wrote in the chat, you provided a, dis, uh, a definition of disinformation. So thank you very much for that. I think it's very interesting. Uh, do you think that the COVID-19 crisis is actually gonna help uh, refocus our energy on local journalists? Because it is having a kind of a bit of a revival. Um, and do you think basically, you know, those platforms will make fake information spread further or are we going to turn a corner and live with uh, rainbows and unicorns? Uh, Damien, <laughs> uh, pass it on to you. Sure. Well, those are great questions, Phil, and thank you very much to you and the team for inviting me. Um, I'm happy to address that first and then perhaps take a step back to talk about sort of three main beats that I want to hit, which is uh, looking at misinformation and information disorder, the kind of the role of journalism and trust, and then looking at some potential policy questions and challenges. And I'm deliberately going to try and throw out a lots of different ideas to kind of see uh, what sticks with people who are on the chat and who are following us um, on, on Twitter, because this is an incredibly complex issue. But to your question about kind of, will this lead to a revival in, in local journalism? Um, I think the, the answer, with, as with a lot of this stuff, is it's complicated. Um, we can certainly say that in the US, as in many other countries around the world, local journalists are the most trusted of all groups of journalists. And the key reason for that, I think, is because you are clued into and connected to your community. Uh, you see local journalists out and about and reporting, which you never do if, for seeing uh, journalists at the New York Times or the Washington Post and so forth. You know, they are 
very kind of distant journalistic realities, whereas you might well bump into a local journalist in your coffee shop or at the school gates, um, at, at an evening event, at your church, at your synagogue and so forth. So that I think um, uh, really helps in terms of engendering trust that, the, that those journalists are part of uh, that community. They share many of the same values and interests and day-to-day -day concerns that their readers and that, that, that their audience has. The challenge here is that the business model, uh, which was already finding the going incredibly tough, has just been decimated by COVID-19. That so much of the media industry remains advertising dependent um, and as advertisers have essentially kind of shut up shop and marketing budgets have, have disappeared so too have a lot of jobs so the new york times has a, has a page with a kind of running count of journalists who have lost their jobs um, had their hours cut or been furloughed so essentially kind of been put on a form of, of of leave that hopefully they can come back when the finances improve and in the us alone we've seen thirty six thousand journalists in those three categories of losing their jobs having their hours cut or being furloughed since this pandemic uh, went mainstream so in the space of less than two months the almost you know, the, no corner of that industry is unaffected so um, you, know, you can trust journalists all you like um, and we'll come on to some of the fact that some people do and do not trust journalists um, late, later on but you also have to ask will they be around to even do this reporting and to pose the questions that communities need answers to um, and uh, that throws up some very real questions then about who should pay for journalism whether that that is the role of uh, of governments, whether tech platforms should be contributing to that, uh, particularly at a time when we as consumers, as news consumers, um, have in many cases less less money because we might have lost our jobs or had our hours cut and so forth. And actually, it comes down to: Do I can I afford this news subscription, um, or am I looking at paying bills, putting money away for a rainy day, and and, and so forth? You know, these are really tough day to day questions. I want to take a step back from that, though, to kind of look at some of the, the bigger picture questions. I mean, you mentioned earlier that you had this great quote, which said, you know, misinformation can kill. And I wanted to point out that actually it always has. And if you kind of go back in history, Mark Antony famously committed suicide because he believed that Cleopatra had, uh, had died um, and uh, she hadn't. And he ended up uh, dying in her arms. So misinformation, fake news, this is nothing new, but um, obviously, um, as we've heard, you know, the volume, velocity and vector of this is what is, has, has really changed. So I think when you look at the misinformation space, the first thing I'd say is, you know, one of the, the, the most difficult issues here is it becomes increasingly difficult to discern fact from fiction. How can you tell real news from real fake, particularly on social networks? Because anybody can publish to those networks and all content looks the same. You can get material produced by somebody in their bedroom or by a troll army, which looks just as professional and polished as material produced by credible news outlets. We also know that the business models of the, of the tech platforms, which we've touched on, uh, also can contribute to some of this problem because they're serving you content based on your browsing history and on what they think you want to see. Uh, and they're also serving you ads around that too. So it was really interesting to see that until only four days ago, if you had pseudoscience as something that you were interested in, you would be targeted ads um, around that, even though the very name itself, pseudoscience, suggests that there's something a little bit hooky about it. So I think that's the first thing I'd want to say is the challenge of discerning fact from fiction is incredibly hard. Um, second thing I'd look at is um, we've talked about the complexities of misinformation and disinformation. Um, I think the key thing here, and I'm sure we'll talk more about definitions and so forth, uh, is around motive and intent and the difference between sharing information that people have not quite understood um, or they've misinterpreted, or I would say they've perhaps taken some science that they don't necessarily fully understand and have tried to interpret it. And journalists are just as guilty of that as, as, as anybody else. There's a difference between sharing something with positive intentions, but getting it wrong versus sharing something that is deliberately has a specific malicious intent. And I think the next wave of this that we're going to see during the course of, uh, of this pandemic is going to be kind of more national level um, propaganda. We've already touched on the fact that there is discussions floating around um, uh, 
uh, in China about uh, this being created in a lab and it being uh, the US's responsibility, well, the same conversation is happening in the US, but with China as, in inverted commas, the bad guy. Um, and we've seen this um, in, in, all around the world that, that countries uh, are, are weaponizing social media to kind of push uh, particular points of view, and so are uh, communities who have particular beliefs um, around that. So, you know, the, the complexities that we see here, I think, are only going to, to grow, but they're also going to change and evolve as the impact of this pandemic um, continues. So, what can we do about this? The third thing I wanted to point out is just the challenge of managing this. Uh, Jennifer talked about the volume, the velocity, and the vector. I mean, there is so much material and content being shared, and it's being shared so incredibly quickly. You could employ all the journalists and fact checkers that you want at a social network, and you would not even begin to get close to uh, being able to review everything. So we automatically, you know, as a result, we are going to see uh, artificial intelligence, AI, having to uh, drive uh, a lot of that, a lot of that work, um, and that needs to become more sophisticated than and and algorithms and those kind of um, machine learning programs you know are clearly influenced by human actors so we have to continue to to try and, and shape that um, but it is incredibly complicated because of the volume and we also should point out that uh, that that doesn't necessarily help with the challenge of closed networks so many of these conversations taking place in on app, apps like uh, telegram or taking place in uh, WhatsApp groups. These are encrypted networks uh, where the networks themselves cannot see, in theory, uh, what is being said and is being shared. Um, and so that makes it very difficult to not only uh, dive in and correct conversations or point people to, to other resources, but to even know what's being discussed in the first place. And there have been some efforts to try and mitigate that. So in India, where we have seen huge amounts of misinformation over the past couple of years on WhatsApp, uh, that really was the, uh, the driver for limiting how many times you could forward uh, a message. And that was one of the ways in which actually they've, they've found that there's been some success in um, reducing the spread of misinformation but it's incredibly complicated. So that's kind of like a quick overview of, of misinformation. Then what about the role of journalism and uh, very much in inverted commas, the facts? Um, you know, as you said, I'm a journalist. I also studied history at university, which was all about facts. Um, and now we get to a point where actually deciding what is true and whose version of the truth are we talking about is incredibly complex. We live in a very hyper-partisan political and media landscape. That's very uh, pronounced in the US, but I think we also see that in, in other countries. In the UK, we very much saw that around, around Brexit, where you have very different realities and perceptions of what constitutes reality, where there is uh, incredible variances in terms of trust in media and also trust in institutions. So as part of the, uh, of the Twitter conversation prior to this hyper chat, it was interesting to see people talking about the role of the WHO and of people kind of trusting that as a resource on social media. But there are many people who, who equally do not trust the WHO. We have a government here in the US who've said they're no longer prepared to, to fund that. You do have higher levels of trust in scientists and organizations like the CDC than kind of government and journalists. But of course, this is so new that they are also grappling with uh, uh, what's, what's going on and, and have made mistakes and missteps along the way. And that in turn is of course also impacting on, on trust levels. So how we define uh, facts and truth is incredibly complicated. And even if social networks take stuff down, the hyper-partisan media can still provide an application platform for this. So just yesterday, there was a huge thing that kicked off in the evening here where there was a video that YouTube took down from some Californian doctors who were essentially comparing the COVID-19 pandemic with the flu and, uh, and, and I think saying that the flu um, was, uh, was worse. This was taken down by YouTube um, and then uh, Tucker Carlson in his Fox show basically went off on one about, about the role of YouTube as an arbiter of what constitutes the truth. Um, and of course, some of the views that were put forward by these doctors, which was seen as being in breach of YouTube's guidelines, um, 
do play into the the narrative that Fox News um, have been covering. Um, meanwhile, on MSNBC, at exactly the same time, you had you had a, a presenter and journalist providing a takedown of that same video. So same conversation happening in parallel on two completely different networks with two completely different points of view. You know, who do you trust? Where is the reality in that in that space? And so not surprisingly, as a part of that, um, people are increasingly turning not to uh, kind of trusted intermediaries that we might have used in the past, like journalists or scientists, but they're turning to their friends, they're turning to, to groups. Um, and this throws up, you know, interesting questions around confirmation bias, around media literacy, and um, uh, the ability and indeed willingness of people to uh, look deeply into stories from a variety of different perspectives to try and ascertain what constitutes the truth. Um, people are exhausted by the COVID-19 pandemic. I know a lot of people who are purposefully tuning out of the news because they're kind of overwhelmed by it. The last thing they want to do is actually dive deeper and look at multiple sources, even though that might be something that they should be doing. Um, some other kind of key points I wanted to quickly make, um, and I'm sure we'll come back to more more um, in, in the questions. I mean, we also have to look at, at, I mean, I mentioned about AI, but just the kind of the role of, of algorithms in general, in terms of the fact that social networks are entirely driven by, by algorithms. Um, so there is very much a risk of promoting and, and sharing uh, falsehoods. I think for one of me, one of the biggest concerns is that because a lot of people do not understand how these networks work and how your news feeds work, they don't understand that it is algorithmically generated and that there isn't a human editorial uh, process uh, behind that. There's a risk that kind of amplifying falsehoods or uh, sources that are perhaps less than, than credible gives them credibility, kind of pours more fuel um, on the fire. And that what also happens, and the, and the mainstream media is just as guilty of this, is that you will have kind of fringe events, fringe conversations that are taking place that get amplified as a result of media coverage. And in turn, that creates uh, a veneer of credibility. And that's always been the case, um, but I just think it's potentially more dangerous than, than, than ever. And then lastly, let's just talk about what we can do in the policy space, because this is all incredibly complicated, but perhaps there are some things that we can do. So that we, it's interesting that we're starting to see some discussions about a tech windfall tax. So recognizing that um, the role of journalism and independent reporting and fact checking is, is important um, and that the, the news and uh, news industry has kind of really suffered over the course of the last two decades as a result of its advertising model being disrupted and most of that advertising moving to digital platforms. Some discussion about uh, whether some of those monies should go back to the news industry um, as a result of some sort of uh, one-off uh, windfall tax. Um, I think there's there's definitely questions around uh, regulation. It's great that you've uh, polled people about that. Uh, I definitely think there is an increased risk of regulation as a result of this um, situation. Um, uh, and that actually there's a lot of pressure on the platforms to get this right and to learn from some of the lessons of uh, Cambridge Analytica scandal um, and that um, if they don't get it right they're at risk of either having regulation forced upon them or of being broken up or being forced to perhaps operate in, in slightly different ways which is something that if I was a tech insider, I absolutely would not want to happen. So um, there's a there's a there's a very strong incentive to try and get this get this right, or at least try and mitigate the risks, because I think it can impact not just on the reputation of your business, but also the structure of your business. Um, and then last two points I wanted to make. I mean, I think there's a cultural angle to this, which I think is really interesting. I mean, what more can these tech companies do in terms of opening up the data and insights that they have, vast amounts of data to researchers? What can they do in terms of opening that up now so we can understand what is happening in terms of misinformation and information disorder right now and potentially use that to be able to come up with mitigation strategies? Um, when we also look at the, how the cultural history of COVID-19 will be, will, be, will be written. I think in part, social media will be a huge part of that, that people's posts on social networks are essentially the handwritten diaries of the 21st century. Um, we've seen posts saying, you know, talking about how Newton helped to develop his theory of relativity um, during um, a, a pandemic that Shakespeare wrote 
King Lear. Would they be doing that in 2020 or would they be baking bread and posting pictures of it on Instagram and doing dance challenges on TikTok? I mean, I think there's a, there's a really interesting questions about, about how we use social media to spend our time and how when we want to tell the social history of this period. Um, uh, a lot of that will play out through social. And then, and then the point I want to end on, because I know I've run out of time here, is to say, you know, when you look at the, the role of these tech giants, they are incredibly powerful lobbyists and advocates for their own cause and their own business. They've been incredibly successful at doing that. Uh, they have very strong direct channels to, uh, to government. Um, what more could they be doing, not just in terms of uh, advocating for their own interests, but perhaps taking a step back and being advocates for the wider information industries, which includes news and journalism as part of that, particularly right now? Can they perhaps park some of their own vested self-interests and talk more widely about the information ecology and their role as just one of the players within that mix? Thank you very much for that, David. That was, that was very interesting. I think touched on a lot of different topics. Um, we're going to go back to the community and to some of the points that were raised. Um, I, I like the point you said about local journalists being highly trusted. I wonder if that applies to the EU bubble journalists. Um, I don't know, Jennifer, you'll have to tell us if you think you are amongst the highly trusted journalists. I, I, I actually think that, that you know, the EU bubble journalists are the local journalists of Brussels. Um, and I think that's interesting. I think you, you talked a lot about the, the complexity uh, of all this and, and, and Jennifer mentioned it and it's not going to go away by some, there's no simple solution. But I do think that if we identify this problem as, you know, the fact that it can kill people and it does, and we really need to fix it. And I mean, that means we just need to channel energy, we need to put resources, we need to penalize in a much stricter way. So I think that you know, it, it, we, we need to really look at that. And I think the notion, I, I completely agree with you, the perception and reality are, are very difficult things to identify, but there is a thing called the scientific method and you can test certain things, then you can check your sources before you share something and verify something. So I don't think we should uh, kind of give up and say, oh my God, it's too complicated. I think we have to say it's complicated, but actually it's important enough for us to start working on it. So I'd like to turn to Leora because I know we've had questions, comments from uh, the crowd and we, we have, um, we're going to go on for at least another 10 minutes because I don't think that things will shut down at, at uh, half past four just to make sure that we can have uh, a bit more follow-up discussion. So Leora, over to you. And yes, to the we, have, uh, we have some interesting questions. Before we go there, I also wanted to share a few uh, things with you, for example, uh, what's happening on Twitter. So we, you see that what's happening on this chat is already being turned into Twitter material by our social media team. So you see this uh, very good tweet uh, quote from Jennifer is being turned into this quote, the image on Twitter. So how do you decide what sort of information is harmful when the president of the United States speculates that drinking bleach might be a good idea? We like that tweet. Uh, we like that quote, so it's now a tweet on uh, um, Twitter in this nice format with a nice picture of Jennifer. Um, I also wanted to share with you that we have posted a fake news detection guide um, on Twitter with uh, 10 points on how you yourself can check if something is real or fake. So, uh, you know, that is something that all of us can be encouraged to do. We all have our biases. Uh, we can all, we all like things without having read the article, without having researched a story. We share things with our families in groups app, group apps. So um, you might want to look at that. We have just shared this uh, this morning on our Twitter channel. Now back to the questions, um, because we have a lot of questions. I would like to ask Luke to ask a question uh, because he had a good question in the uh, chat. Luke, are you there? I am there, can you hear me? Yes, Luke Chomet, um, we can hear you. Cool, um, I would show my face if I could. I don't see a way to do that. Uh, no, unfortunately that's not possible. Okay, because that's that's fine. Um, no, what, what I wanted to dig deeper in, I would like to ask your, your, your panelists, uh, every one of you actually, it's, um, it's about the burden on, on, on social media platforms. So it's about, you know, how difficult is it? Uh, the, Phil just mentioned that in passing. 
Um, obviously, it's difficult. Uh, obviously, it's difficult to know what is the truth. I mean, newspapers, old media, they always struggle with objectivity and the truth. So obviously, it's difficult to, to spot fake news, to stop them. Uh, velocity, Jennifer is absolutely right. Velocity, volume, all that is difficult. But is it because it's difficult that you can, it can be done? I mean, it's not impossible. And why is it that we believe that because of the volume um, that it's impossible to do anything? It looks like uh, every time Zuckerberg or anyone else says, well, we can't do it. You imagine there are so many people. We can't check the fact checkers, etc. We can't do anything. And, and I'm just very surprised by that. That seems like lobbying working right there because it is possible. I mean, they have uh, an average American and Canadian user of Facebook brings $60 per year to Facebook. So they, they do have some money and they do have means. So it's, it's kind of fake news for me to think that they have no ways to do anything. And, and collectively, we, we should all, I mean, obviously they can't be legally, as, as Jennifer said, they can't be legally accountable for anything said on, on the platform, that's for sure. But accountable, yes, of course they can be accountable. And we should be accountable too. If I, as, as someone said, if we scream, you know, there's a bomb here, well, I should be forbidden to do that in a church, for example. So it's, 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 um, it's something to be defined all together, but um, we should at least try. And, and, and just one final note is that when you see that this, you, you heard a lot of, uh, science people in the past two months saying, well, science is slow. We don't have all the answers right now. But s science is trusted by most people because it is slow. And social media is fast. It is a lot of volume, yes. So, but that's, that's why there's a bit of trust there. So maybe, maybe social media could be slowed a little bit. You know, it could be a bit slower. That would be okay to have news 30 minutes later. Um, so I don't wanna, you know, uh, you know, I want, I want to have our social media alive and, and, and free, but you understand, we can try starting now. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Damien, how would you respond? Um, well, I think you've made so many great points there, Luke. Uh, I agree. I mean, I think the way you describe this in the chat, I think we're being duped by the zucks of this world into thinking <laughs> it's not realistic to make them, uh, to, for them to do this. Uh, I think that's a really good point. I would say, um, the, for me, the big issue here is right now, it's just not in their interest to do this. That if there was a financial incentive um, to find a way to be able to address these issues, I have no doubt they would be able to do so. Um, I mean, if you look at some of the innovations that we have seen on social networks, then um, I mean, a, a good example back from 2015, they introduced this thing called instant articles, which meant if you saw a story on your feed from say The Guardian, Prior to that point, if you clicked on that, it took you out of the Facebook app to the Guardian's website, and then a lot of people wouldn't come back to Facebook afterwards because they've, they've gone off site. Then in 2015, they introduced the innovation, which meant I could read the article within Facebook. I don't disappear out of their, their ecosystem. Um, and that was you know, incredibly successful in terms of uh, ensuring people spent more time on that on that network. So there was, but there was a financial incentive to Facebook for behaving in that way. How do we deliver uh, uh, either force that um, by encouraging that they have to spend a certain amount of of uh, advertising revenue per user uh, towards this, which could be is something that potentially could be mandated, um, or encourage them to say, okay, find a way to monetize this then. Given that this is, uh, that that is your modus operandi, how can you potentially um, look at some of these, some of these issues and do so in a way that actually is good for your business model rather than one that is detrimental? Excellent. We have Audrey uh, uh, who wants, an, wants to ask a question as well. Audrey, are you there? Hello? Yes, hi. Hi, hi everyone. Thank you so much for uh, this uh, uh, amazing debate. It's um, it's well organized. Thank you to <laughs> Ben Consulting. Uh, you already know that uh, I love you guys, so <laughs> you're really doing a, a great job. And um, uh, Damien, um, um, it's, my question is about um, the, the the difference between news industry and the digital platform. I mean the their competency. Uh, what do you think about the, the newspapers that uh, kind of hijack, but in a good way, hijack YouTube uh, with their 
content with their deep dive content with their um, profound content um, because in, from Europe from our point of view uh, we have uh, both the main uh, newspapers uh, Euroactive and Politico who uh, that um, have made the pivot and uh, some of their uh, journalists even turned out to be uh, kind of YouTubers with uh, with success and um, I, I was wondering if you had such thing in uh, the US or um, what do you think about this new tendency of, about the journalism? It's a great question. I mean, journalists want to be read or seen, so you go where the eyeballs are. And YouTube uh, is has a huge, a huge audience, and so and a very active and a very engaged one. So it makes sense for news organisations and journalists to increasingly use YouTube as a form of. Uh, distribution. Uh, I'm also trying to use that as a way to be able to monetize the work that they are doing um, as well. Um, and I think it's a massively um, unexplored space, actually. Um, I asked my students at the start of every term, where do you get your news from? And uh, you see kind of lots of ebbs and flows between what is the news organization of the, of the moment. Uh, so a couple of years ago, it was all about Vice and BuzzFeed, and that has now kind of gravitated back towards more traditional news organizations. But consistently in that mix is YouTube of people saying they purposefully go, these are millennials, they purposefully go to YouTube to find out and to watch the news. And I need to dig deeper into that. Um, we've also seen uh, with the Digital News Report, which is a, a, a massive study published every year by the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism at Oxford. Last year uh, covered 28 countries, 75,000 respondents around the world, that YouTube, again, was an incredibly popular channel for people uh, accessing the news. Uh, I don't feel there's enough of a discussion about that. We talk a lot about the news on Twitter. We've been guilty of doing that today. You have to remember that Twitter is much more of an echo chamber than YouTube is. It reaches a much smaller percentage of the population uh, and that actually we need to think much more about the larger more mainstream social networks both as channels for distribution of our own work but also in terms of understanding the preferences and habits of news consumers. Thank you very much. Um, so I would just like to go to the results of our poll um, which was um, how should social media platforms handle misinformation and everyone said well most of you said EU regulation so you are in favor of an EU type of regulation and I also wanted to go to the two more polls and then we're done with the polls uh, freedom of speech versus fake news we had a bit of debate on that on our Twitter channel so what is more important freedom of speech or fighting fake news or protecting freedom of speech or um, so yeah, so let's just answer it as it stands. Freedom of speech or fighting fake news or are you not sure? I'm gonna launch the poll so you can see it. What's more important, fighting freedom of speech or fighting fake news? You will see that most of you who have voted are in favor of protecting free speech, which would mean that you don't want EU regulation. <laughs> so uh, it's a complicated uh, topic. Um, so let's just move to the final poll just to get your um, to, to go into this and try to get some simple answer. Is it possible to tell real news from fake news? No, uh, most of the time, sometimes, or yes. Is it possible to tell real news from fake news? And we started with no, <laughs> that's interesting. Most of the time, sometimes, or yes. So in terms of this result of the, this final poll, um, I'm gonna share the results with you. And people think it is possible to tell real news from fake news most of the time. So I think it's, um, I mean, it's interesting, obviously, this is a pretty short discussion on, on a very complex topic as, as we've been saying. But I, I do think that we're, you know, that what I see emerging is that the complexity should not be an excuse. And that basically, number one, um, there are ways to do it and they're complicated and they might require work, but um, they're not impossible. And I think Luke raised that question, made that point. And I, and I believe both Jennifer and, and Damien agreed that, I mean, work can be done, things can be put in place. And of course, tough questions have to be asked, but eventually uh, we, can, we can get to a much better landscape than the one we are in today. 
Uh, I think the other thing I, I like the comment on the idea that you know complexity is used as an argument, as a lobbying argument to say let's not do this because it's too complicated. I think we have to be you know we shouldn't fall for that trap. Um, and I I don't think we necessarily fully fully address that. And I think it's because it's a conversation that's unfolding. Is I think COVID nineteen is clearly having an impact. Uh, although it's not the first time and it's certainly not the last time, but I think it's probably a moment when there's more visibility on the, the importance of this. Um, so I think we've had these, these um, very interesting, very detailed insights. And uh, you know, I, I encourage you to support, to share on Twitter, the articles and the links and the, the proper, not fake news stories that allow people to just inform themselves and read and go deeper into this because as you know, we don't have time to, to do that now, but you can continue afterwards. Um, yeah, that's exactly what I wanted yeah. to say, if I may, sorry, Phil. Um, I, there are so many good comments and questions made in the chat and also accidentally in the Q&A part of the um, story. Um, and unfortunately, we don't have time to answer all of those questions or to go into all of those good comments, but if you move them from the chat into Twitter, and some of you have already done this, which I appreciate, and we are resharing on our channel, this is where we can continue the debate and, and answer more of the questions. Uh, maybe even Jennifer or Damon would be, we would be willing to answer a few questions there. Um, and definitely we can continue the conversation so that um, questions that we weren't able to answer today we will be able to answer and also in two weeks we will have another hyper chat and we hope you will all join us uh, uh, but we're not done now because we have a kahoot no, no before we go to the to the amazing kahoot that, that everybody's <laughs> dying to do i just want to give the opportunity to to damien jennifer to maybe give that final thought in a very brief nutshell so 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 damien i'll go to you first and then i'll be the final a thought to, to Jennifer. Damien, your, your, your final takeaway from, from this discussion? Oh, sorry, we have, a, we have to unmute you. Um, there we go. Uh, can, yep, go ahead. So um, yep. I agree we'll say it's complicated. Um, for me, the kind of final thought is to say that we also, as consumers, have to take some responsibility in this space. So I think you cannot separate the media literacy and news literacy conversation as part of this argument. And we have to look at more at what can be done um, in schools, uh, working with, with adults, working with people across all ages to help them understand the complexities of the modern day information infrastructure um, and ensuring that people are given um, the right uh, kind of skills and training um, to be able to discern fact from fiction. And I wonder whether, you know, given that all these kids are learning from home uh, on the internet right now, this is not the perfect moment to start learning how to fact check. So maybe somebody somewhere needs to kind of launch an online course to get everybody to learn to fact check and, and make that compulsory to learn how to check information. Jennifer. Well, and there, and there are examples of that. And I would just say, you know, like in Italy, they do actually have that as part of their, their school system, but uh, we, need, we need more of that. And the parents who are helping to homeschool the children equally need to be upskilled in this, in yeah. this, this space. Absolutely. Jennifer. Uh, well, just finally to tackle that freedom of speech and regulation question, I don't think it's an either or. I think in fact, good laws can help defend freedom of speech within this framework. Um, as we have established practices in journalism, uh, whereby you get two sources for every story, you do your double checking, your fact checking. Uh, you know, fact checking used to be part of the job. Can I just say, we didn't need independent fact checkers. It used to be an expected and demanded part of the job of the journalist. And um, as well as these informal norms, we also have legal responsibilities, sort of things like slander, hate speech, definitions, um, uh, defamation as well, that already exists. So we've got rules that both protect freedom of speech and combat disinformation in traditional media. And I don't think it's impossible that this can be done in the, the, the online tech framework as well. Uh, it certainly can be done. Huge tech companies have huge resources. And there's a lot of low hanging fruit that can be done very quickly. There are gonna be gray areas. Of course there are gonna be gray areas. And that's why I want a regulator or the courts or some sort of legal framework within which these tech pub publications or tech, sorry, publishers, tech, tech, big tech companies, platforms, let's call them, um, do take down disinformation because I think 
they can do it, but it should be based within a framework of law and policy guidelines that have come out of a social discussion about the demands of society and not the demands of corporate money making. Thank you, Jennifer, and, and thank you, Damien, for, for those final thoughts. I just want to thank everybody who's been involved in this conversation. I think it was really interesting, and I, I just literally, I really find the topic very important, very interesting. We've had this hyper chat. There is no corporate sponsor. There's no lobbying money behind it. So this is all what we think and what you know Jennifer and Damien think. So I mean, you know, for in Brussels, there's often a focus. Uh, there isn't one here. I mean, what we just want to showcase is that we. It's important to have these conversations. This is to me a burning question. Uh, in two weeks' time, we're going to talk about vaccines, COVID nineteen, and social media. So of course, there I think we'll go really into. Uh, the life or death uh, discussions around this. But uh, I, I just want to say I, I thought it was fascinating and I really appreciate the depth uh, that you both kind of, the, the, the questions that you explored and the things you put on the table. I hope people uh, really appreciated everything. And, and Lira, thank you for the amazing hyper moderation you did and the team to all the tweets. And guys, when you go out and check out Twitter, you'll see it's, it's the beginning of the conversation. This is not where it ends, it's where it begins. Uh, now, for, the, for this amazing moment you've all been waiting for, uh, go ahead, Leora. Yes. So, guys, this is very exciting. So, we're going to do a Kahoot. And what that means is that you need to go to kahoot.it and type in 245392 and then your name. And then your name. On your phone. Or, on your phone. You can do this on your phone. Yeah. because You go to kahoot.it on your phone and type in your name. Well, we first type in the pin and then your name. So the pin is 245392, as you see, right? You can do this too, uh, moderators. Jennifer, Damien, and we'd be happy for you to join. And Phil. Mm. Phil hasn't seen it either, so he... Mm -hmm. I will see the names appearing. I don't see any names appearing just yet. So as soon as they appear... I'm oh, getting that they don't recognize that pin. Yeah, two, four, I have five, I'm three, three nine, nine, two. Yeah, that's true, Lyra. Uh, there's a, there's a... I think our pin is wrong. Yeah. Oh, it's maybe because I, I started it yesterday. Hold, give me one second, Phil, and uh, yeah. guys, In the can meantime, you one thing? In the meantime, I will, I will uh, yes. make sure that I, as these things happen, uh, I'm sorry, you I need to have well. your background ready, and that's why I'm switching to the... <laughs> Tiger King background that you all want, and yes, we will share it online. So if you want to impress your friends at your next Zoom meeting, you too can have a crazy background for a crazy series or a more conventional, uh, may, we made uh, digital. So, I mean, this is basically the time when we enjoy, uh, well, when we're learning how to do crazy amounts of online conferences. And uh, I think it's probably going to create some uh, trauma after in the next couple of weeks of just spending too much time focusing on a screen and wondering what you look like and what your backdrop looks like, um, which is why, of course, we have to do things with our um, amazing backdrop. And we can also do some, see some live promotion. So um, this was actually part of the purpose of the exercise for us, which is to, uh, to play and test new ways of doing uh, online discussions. We actually chose not to go for a kind of PowerPoint format because the problem with that is that uh, it, I, I, I'm finding those formats a little difficult to to follow. I think it's better to have a human conversation and we have been going in and out of uh, uh, online. And I think for me, what I found was most interesting was that yesterday when we started really driving the conversation on Twitter, uh, it was really quite active. Uh, and I, I think that when you start on Twitter, go to this kind of discussion where people can go a little bit deeper and then continue on Twitter, I think that works. Lira, have you found the pin? Unfortunately, <laughs> we can only do it with 10 people. It's my... I'm ah, that's the, that's the thing. Okay, well, this is another thing that the, part of the joys of experimenting. And if, if any of you have ever worked with ZN, we believe that you have to do trial and error and that you don't learn if you don't screw up from time to time. We embrace it. Um, something up. Um, and uh, I think, as you saw, uh, a lot of things uh, worked fantastically. So uh, we will do a Kahoot. I probably probably need to upgrade the license to get over to, to 20 people. Um, and you will see this with the vaccine uh, uh, 
uh, discussion hyper chat. Join so, us next time how to see how fun that can be. <laughs> it's going to be amazing. So we're actually building up the tension. So again, I want to thank our panelists. I want to thank Damien for getting up at six thirty in the morning. Uh, thank Early you so much for doing that. Uh, <laughs> Jennifer, <laughs> thank you for your amazing. Up. Uh, exactly. contributions and uh, I, I, it was really really very interesting I was I, I really want to dive deeper into this and I, I there were a lot of people in the call who are from the Commission who either uh, joined the call or hopefully will watch this uh, later so I hope that they also really work because you know I think GDPR has been an example of legislation from Europe that can shape a global uh, issue and maybe there is something that, that Europe can do to basically reshape the conversation on social media. And thanks to you all for doing the hyper moderation and to the team for all the tweeting and all the support. Have a fantastic rest of the day. Have a great break on Friday and we will see you next time. Thank Bye, you everyone. everyone. Bye. Bye.